Cool. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, and thanks so much for joining us. My name is David Zilber. Uh, I'm a, a chef and fermenter, uh, an author uh, working in Copenhagen University, or uh, no, I'm not <laughs> working in Copenhagen. I don't work at the university. Um, and on behalf of my uh, co-organizers, uh, Elisa Caffrey and Justin Sonnenberg, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Fermentation and Health Speaker Series from the Center for Human Microbiome Studies at the University of Stanford School of Medicine. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Dr. Suzanne Devkota gave a fantastic presentation on the current understanding of the limitations uh, of fermented food consumption in a clinical setting. She really highlighted the need for a better understanding of this chemical composition of microbially transformed foods, particularly when making health recommendations. You know, there's obviously a clear need for randomized human clinical trials in this field. Uh, but health extends beyond just the clinic. And so the next few speakers in this series are going to help, uh, help us expand the definition of health, highlight the potential roles that fermented foods can and do play from social to the environmental. Sustainability will be the focus of today. What can microbial foods teach us about sustainable practices? And how can we apply and innovate fermentation techniques to develop flavorful, tasty foods while lowering the environmental costs of producing food? So before introducing our speaker, a little housekeeping. This series will be recorded and posted in the next few days as both video and audio. Feel free to write in any questions in the Q&A, upvote questions you like, and we will do our best to get to them at the end of the presentation. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, a, a longtime friend of mine and former coworker, Dr. Joshua Evans. Dr. Evans is a senior researcher and leader of the Sustainable Food Innovation Group at the Center for Biosustainability at the Technical University of Denmark, or DTU. His multidisciplinary group uses culinary research and development to make flavorful, sustainable, and often fermented foods, applying scientific methods to study their flavor, ecology, and evolution. Bring social science and artistic practice in to the fold to understand and experiment with how they might fit into food culture at large. Josh has participated in some really exciting projects over the years, starting as a lead researcher of the Nordic Food Lab, where I first met him. Um, and <laughs> also collaborating on projects with MIT, sending, of all things, MISO into space. So Josh, the floor is yours. Please have at it. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction and to Elisa and Justin also for inviting me to be part of the series. Uh, super interesting group of people to be able to join. Um, and I'm going to spend, I guess, the first part of the time we have today talking a little bit about some of my work. Uh, and then David and I are going to have a little conversation. Uh, and there will be time for questions, as, as David mentioned. I'm going to share some slides here. Uh, right. So this was the kind of, this was the question that I was interested in using to frame some of my work over the years. What is the connection between fermentation, flavor innovation, and biodiversity? And, you know, when I formulated this question and sent it to Elisa, uh, I immediately thought that's maybe a poorly formulated question because it suggests that there's only one connection when of course there's many, probably many connections here. And I'm going to try to explore maybe just uh, just one or two because we don't have so much time. But before I continue, I can also say the second part of this question is also how does this connection between these really big ideas and sets of practices relate to health? That's of course the theme of the whole series. And before I go into some of the work, I'd like to maybe just suggest a few themes there that we can think about um, as I'm talking about a couple of these examples. So one is like, maybe we can also start to think about health across scales from the bodily scale to the planetary scale. That's something I think is really interesting. And that's something of course, that many people are talking about these days. Um, there, of course, we can, like, we can start to think about how health relates to things like sustainability and regeneration as David was talking about. And finally, um, you know, I think this is, this is also something that will come in from the examples that I'll talk about, about when we're exploring sustainability, maybe this is particularly on my mind because at the moment my group is at the technical university, so it's very well technical um, and so focused on materials and processes and technology and all of those exciting things. 
However, when we're exploring and talking about sustainability, I'm very convinced that we're not just talking about things and we can't only be focused on products, say, in the context of food, but we have to be also thinking just as much about ways of thinking um, and the relationship between making things and thinking about things, I think is very important and very fascinating. So without further ado, I will give a little bit of background. So this story, I guess, starts for me in many ways at Nordic Food Lab, uh, as David mentioned. It was this, doesn't exist anymore, but some years ago, it was a nonprofit open source research gr uh, group that was founded by Noma. Um, and our job was to do a lot of the fundamental research that was sort of upstream of the, of the actual test kitchen where dishes were made um, to learn about the biodiversity and the edible potential of the Nordic region and share those results, not only with the restaurant, but very widely with um, academics and other chefs and anyone really who was interested. Um, we did a lot of fermentation there uh, and particularly using fermentation to create new flavors that could be used on the menu and you know, maybe flavors that, uh, that at least many of us at the time were not familiar with. It was, of course, still is very exciting. It was, uh, there's still so much to explore and that's probably even more true uh, back then, now a few years ago. So, but this idea, I think the more that I was learning about, uh, the more that we were, using these techniques to develop new flavors, I was also learning a little bit about the microbiology in a very basic way, learning how quickly a lot of these microbes change and adapt to new environments um, and how they share their genetic information very messily and promiscuously with each other. And the thought started to occur to me that, um, you know, without realizing it or trying to, this approach of pursuing flavor might also be having inadvertent consequences. These chefs might, without realizing it, without trying to be bringing new forms of life into the world, creating new niches where different kinds of microbial ecologies could emerge that might not otherwise emerge. Maybe even new, eventually new processes of speciation happening. That was a very sort of captivating idea to me. And that, that idea became the, the sort of seed of my PhD research which I spent the next four or five years <laughs> doing, um, and it resulted in this thesis. And uh, and I I really wanted to see if that was happening. The short answer is it's complicated, but um, in many in many senses it is it is happening. Uh, and I also became very interested, you know, in exploring not only whether it was happening, but what it might mean for how we think about the relationship between humans and nature how humans and non-humans communicate with each other through the senses, how they experiment with each other, how they shape each other, like in these much longer histories of domestication. So from that, I'm gonna share with you uh, a couple very, um, uh, we don't have time to go super deep into data, but I'm gonna share a little sort of taste of some data um, to try to illustrate what I'm talking about here. So, this is a pretty typical bar plot, and this is based actually on six misos that I believe David himself made <laughs> some years ago. Uh, David, these would have been six misos that you gave me uh, in December of 2017, I think. So sort of a few months into my PhD, and I came back to Copenhagen um, to start to plan my field work and visited you back when the, when the fermentation lab at Noma was in the shipping containers out back of the old restaurant. And David gave me uh, six of these uh, quite novel misos uh, that, that the fermentation lab had made. And they were made out of uh, yellow peas, nixtamalized yellow peas, lupin seeds, uh, a couple of varieties of Swedish pea, and lentils, also a Swedish variety of lentil. Those are down at the bottom. And the first thing we can see here, both comparing the full metagenome, this is metagenomic data, comparing the first, comparing the whole metagenomes to um to a database and also comparing this specific uh this specific marker gene is that these communities vary quite a bit between the different substrates in many ways this is not surprising this is what we would expect to see but i think the extent of the difference is quite remarkable um especially only with these you know quite preliminary samples and secondarily i'd like to draw our attention to this light purple section here 
under the nixtamalized piso on the right. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Um, but there, that's very something very interesting. And what we found here, and this is the first time I'm sharing this data, I'm very excited to share with you. We haven't yet published it, but um, we've been digging further into some of these differences, and we've we believe we may have even found a new species of exigiobacterium uh, that has never been described by science in this nixtamalized piso. Um, as you, this is a phylogenetic tree where we're situating our potential new species uh, and within the within the genus, and you can see that the uh, the next closest species that it's most similar to uh, Exigiobacterium profundum uh, is only it's only 94.5 percent similar, and that's just below the threshold where it's the same species. So we're looking further into that. But all I want to illustrate with this, aside from at least I think it's pretty exciting. Um, is that, you know, in many ways, these experiments of creating new flavors are maybe creating, well, in many cases, creating new kinds of ecological assemblages, uh, maybe even new niches where new kinds of biodiversity can emerge, whether they're species that we have no idea exist, maybe even over the long term, uh, leading to species, new species themselves emerging that are actually particularly adapted to these niches. This genus is really interesting. It's um, also not only a new species, but it's the first time that this any species of this entire genus, at least as far as we found in the literature, has been found in uh, any fermented food at all. It's a genus that um, can, it has quite a wide variety of tolerances. Um, some of them are very halo tolerant. They can tolerate salt. Some of them can tolerate very wide range of pH. Many of them are, are, are often found in kind of rather extreme um, ecological, like extreme environments. Um, so there's a lot that's quite exciting about this. I just, I thought it would be fun to share, share this, uh, this quite new finding with all of you. I want to thank my postdoc Caroline for putting together these figures and doing all the analysis, um, doing a great job. So that's the sort of thing I was, I was uh, developing in my thesis. And now for the last year or so, I'm building up this new research group, which in many ways I'm trying to sort of expand that research program from my thesis and try to connect it to a lot of the culinary R&D work that we were doing at Nordic Food Lab. But now with the focus instead, maybe at Nordic Food Lab, if the main focus was on say regionality, now our main focus is on sustainability. Um, and so with my new group called Sustainable Food Innovation, really interested in trying to bring together culinary R&D to make new foods, using scientific techniques to investigate how these new foods work, and then also some more cultural approaches uh, to see how they can fit into food culture. So when it comes to the culinary R&D, which is really the core of our work, uh, using a lot of these techniques from the, from the restaurant industry, where there's a big focus on flavor, um, to make new and old sustainable foods that have that have this focus on flavor. So like a lot of things that many other people are working on these, these days, using a lot of fermentation, exploring a lot of upcycling of byproducts, focusing on developing new sources of plant-based umami taste. A couple very brief examples um, made by my R&D chef Kim, who used to for many years work at this restaurant in, uh, in Copenhagen called Amass, which has been doing a lot of groundbreaking work on uh, on sustainability in cooking. Um, Kim's developed things like a tonic made from endive root. Endive root sounds very kind of rarefied and uncommon, but in fact, there's like millions of tons of this root that are produced every year in Europe alone. Um, it's 60% of the whole plant. The, the, the endive itself is just the top and most of the weight of the plant is actually this root. It's quite bitter, um, but through a wild fermentation process, and adding some, you know, some, some little tweaks, Kim has made this super tasty uh, tonic water um, that is using this byproduct. It's also really uh, potentially, uh, yeah, there's some potential probiotic um, qualities that we're exploring in it. Um, we're working a lot with plant-based cheese or rather plant cheese uh, to try to actually make it delicious because most of what exists is not super delicious. Um, and another example of Kim's work that I really like is a kind of uh, a shoyu made from the 
my the spent mycelium from farming mushrooms, which themselves are grown on coffee grounds, which I love because it's kind of like a double byproduct plant umami ferment. Super interesting, I think. Um, then when it so when we make a lot of these foods, kind of like with the misos that I talked about from Noma that um, that that you know that David gave me a few years ago. Uh, I think what's so interesting about working with these for, with, for, with these fermentation techniques to explore creating new flavors is that they can also end up generating some really new science. Because in many cases, you know, if these products haven't existed before in the history of the of, of humanity, then um, then there's potentially a lot of really groundbreaking scientific um, uh, scientific work to do with them, uh, studying their ecology and evolution, their flavor chemistry. And their sensory qualities, both how to learn how to make them better, but also maybe to learn new things that can contribute back to these sciences of microbiology, ecology and evolution, um, and food science. And finally, I want to touch a bit on this cultural dimension. And this is actually really my own background. Um, I have more of a background in the humanities and social sciences. And when we're talking about making new products, you know, we could make as many new sustainable products as we want that are super sustainable on paper but if people actually don't eat them then it kind of doesn't matter um and so i think it's very important it's crucial even that we're thinking not only about the product itself but also how to invite people to form relationships with these new products and a big part of that is flavor but a big but there's also some important social and cultural dimensions to that so we're using social science techniques to explore how people relate to these new foods and how they might fit into existing food culture uh, and also potentially invite new ones and also in in some cases uh, collaborating with artists to experiment with how we can cultivate relationships uh, to these foods to microbes into fermentation and to the natural world. And with the last few minutes that I have, I'd like to uh, share with you a little bit more about a recent project that we that we did that is sort of bringing together the food, the science, and the uh, the artistic um, approach. And to sort of illustrate what how using fermentation can help us bring these worlds together, and in turn, what bringing these worlds and approaches together can offer to um, these larger questions about, um, you know, cultivating planetary consciousness uh, and thinking about health across scales. So this artwork um, was called Sensing Holobiont, and it was a recent art science collaboration with uh, an artist duo called Bauman Leahy and some collaborators uh, at the Medical Museum in here in Copenhagen. And the work uh, combining novel gastronomy, interactive insulation, and microbiome research, we invited participants to explore these connections between bodies, species, food, and environment. And taking some cues from this growing movement in the sciences, especially in the life sciences, to recast multicellular organisms as so-called holobionts. This is a relatively new concept to describe uh, ecological assemblages of a host and its microbes together. The work asked, how might a multisensorial ceremony help us realize ourselves as holobionts? And how might this realization change our relationship to our bodies, to eating, and to planetary health? And I'm, I thought it would be fun to maybe walk you through uh, very quickly uh, what the work sort of consisted of. So in, in groups of uh, eight or nine, you and your fellow participants uh, would move through a series of encounters and you'd be invited to taste, to play, to reflect on, and to discuss different dimensions and implications of being a hollow biont. So you would enter the work through a, a ritual around soil and geosmin, the scent of earth, a vast microbiome from which many others emerge, including in food fermentation. The first encounter was with a wild kombucha. So not a kombucha made from an existing kombucha, but a totally novel kombucha that had been assembled spontaneously uh, from a combination of honeybees, sunflowers, and the skin microbiome of Kim, my group's R&D chef, the one who led the whole menu design for the work. From tasting this tangy floral um, assemblage of insect, plant, and human microbiomes, you move to an encounter with sourdough, an ancient 
relationship. You are invited to need a collective starter, adding your hand microbes to the mix. This starter will be used to bake bread for tomorrow's visitors. And now you get to taste bread made from yesterday's starter, swiped through an emulsion made from the leftover bread from the day before, an ongoing cycle of hands, microbes, and nourishment. You're then in invited to encounter to an encounter with prebiotics, probiotics, and eating information. You repopulate the human stoichiometric equation, all the elements that it takes to make you, with missing microbes, drying them in with spirulina ink. You find some slimy natto made from five different grains, legumes, and seeds, and some pickled fibrous vegetables hidden in a squishy cup. Tip them into thin rice paper and taste. Eating for all of you, fibers and acids, consuming materials, but also signals. From here, you and your group are invited to explore a blasted landscape where you can forage your own for the next taste. A crispy shell of Jerusalem artichoke filled with a moral mushroom mousse. Holobionts are not just animals, but extend into and across the landscape like mushroom mycelia with tree roots, fruiting after forest fires. For dessert, it's slime time. You are welcome to a spiraling table of tubes and wide glass bowls filled with basil seeds and raspberry, chia seeds and caramelized honey, guava gel and basil oil. You assemble a small bowl with all these components and notice how as you mix, the different textures of slime and oil mingle but don't entirely combine, a separate togetherness echoing the mucosal membranes of our gut lining, a key hollow biont matrix. And finally, back in the anteroom, you recline together, listening to your own and each other's guts with stethoscopes, connecting orally to our microbial companions. And here I will show just a really short 30 second film to give you a sense of the overall tone uh, of the work. The holobiont is a fascinating and important idea that is starting to revolutionize the life sciences, but it can be hard to fully grasp kind of on an intuitive level what it means for how we should think about relationships between life forms and our own place in it all. Based on the many rich responses we received in the survey feedback after the work, it suggests to us that bringing together art, science, and cooking, particularly through fermentation, can be one quite powerful way to make this holobiont thinking a bit more sensible and intuitively understandable. And this understanding in turn can transform how we see ourselves and help link the health of our bodies to the health of the planet. And that possibility is something that we in the team uh, that created the work are, are hoping to explore further in future iterations. And with that, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues who contributed to uh, the material in my talk today and also to all of you for joining. That was great. Thank you, Josh. Um, a lovely recap of, of, of your work uh, and what you've been up to for the past couple of years and the lovely exhibition and performance and ritual that I was lucky enough to attend. And uh, I, I told you on the night, but that was also a really great way of kind of like encapsulating all of it. Um, I hadn't heard all those descriptions before. Um, especially slime time. That's an all time favorite. <laughs> that was my favorite. Uh, but, one. but just <laughs> just let everyone know that was like the closest I could imagine to being like a child again and, and visiting like a science center um, and like learning about something by doing um, and it's like pretty inside baseball for me so to the general public we got to attend but I can't even imagine how much fun it was um, to to have experienced some of that um Again, thank you for the wonderful presentation uh, and, and for this uh, new iteration um, or installment of the fermentation and health speaker series. 
let's get into the questions because uh, there's some good ones here. Um, one just also just came in, uh, but we'll start with a question from uh, Nicholas. Thank you very much for the cool view on the interaction between experimental fermentation in pursuit of flavors and microbial genetics. My question is how do you deal with the regulatory matters when it comes to these new strains found in food? Yes, good question. Um, well, I mean, so I guess the first thing I can say is I, in my work, don't focus so much on like scaling up or commercializing things. I kind of let other people do that <laughs> um, who are better at it and know how to do that. So it's not a problem that I have to encounter or deal with so much, but of course, safety is, is definitely a huge thing. And I get this kind of question and concern a lot when I'm talking about novel microbial geographies and you know ecological niches. And I think when I first thought of this idea, I was only thinking in terms of like, yeah, human and microbial co-flourishing, you know, everyone's getting along and everything's safe and happy and joyful. But of course, it's not that way, only. And, <laughs> and newness is not always safe and joyful. So um, the safety question is definitely important. I mean, when we are making new foods, um, and especially, well, for example, with these misos, when we found this new exigua bacterium, let's say, or maybe there's even a better example. In another bigger MISO experiment that, we're, that we've run, that we're also doing a lot of analyses on, we found, um, we found a few species of Staphylococcus in. Now, some species of Staphylococcus are totally fine and not to worry about. Other ones are a bit more insidious. And so one thing we can do pretty easily there is to um, you know, analyze the genome for any toxigenic or virulence related genes. And if those genes don't show up in the strains, then it's pretty safe to say that we that the products are safe. Um, so there's there, there are certain kinds of analyses we can do to try to establish the safety that are even upstream of like actually sending the sample off and trying to like analyze it for all possible mycotoxins or whatever. Um, I don't know if that quite answers your question. I guess I assume that by regulatory matters, you had something like that in mind. I guess the other part of regulation, which maybe you had in mind is also more like novel foods regulation. I don't know if that's what you were talking about, but at least in the EU, of course, that's not something that you have in the US, but in, at least in the EU, there's a whole set of EU yeah, regulation about like, you, about if something doesn't have a history of being eaten in the EU before, what is it like 90, 1991 or something? then you have to go through this very expensive, long, arduous process of establishing precedent or paying a lot of money. So anyway, those are some of the considerations around regulation. Yeah. Maybe, maybe while we're on this, if I could just add to that and and um, and get, I, I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts on a few more of these topics here. First of all, Josh, the, um, the talk was fantastic. I think, you know, listening to scientists talk about their science is always infectious chefs talk about food, fermenters talk about ferments, but when you put all three together, it's like really amazing. So that was <laughs> super fun to, to hear you talk about that. Um, I, you know, I, Aliza has, has kind of brought this up over and over again, as we've talked about like ferments and all the novelty, especially like what you guys were doing in the Noma um, fermentation lab. And, uh, you know, I'm just kind of curious hearing about a lot of the kind of lore of, of fermenters and kind of um, how information is passed around. You know, if you see a, a black on top of a, a ferment with, with a, any sort of fungal growth, you want to get rid of it. Some people say if there's anything pink, you want to get rid of it. So there's a lot of like these rules that people have kind of come to, to pass around without, you know, molecular knowledge of what's going on. And I'm curious in terms of how you guys think about exploring, you know, novelty and innovation and all the new stuff that you were exploring. What is the the litmus test for understanding whether something is is safe and ready to, you know, distribute to people or even consume consume yourself? Do you have a set of rules or, or tests that you stick by? Or is it um assume safe until otherwise, you know, other data presents itself. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't ask this question. If you don't, you can also just say- We're gonna out ourselves here. Oh, no, I love the question. I, I mean, David, do you wanna go first or? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say it quickly. Um, I mean, Lars Williams, when, when he was training me in the lab when I first started in there in 2015, 
uh, I asked the same question. Um, uh, and, and he said, David, if we have an experiment that goes bad after following kind of these like broad guidelines of fermentation, salt levels, you know, make sure you tear your scale and understand the exact percentages going in, pH meters, if it's below 4.5, you're good to go, things like that. But of course there would be mold in and around the environment that often we would scrape off of things like miso was kind of inevitable. The same thing with like dry aging beef. There's mold growing on there and you're in, on your porterhouse before it's served to you in your fancy steakhouse, but it is cut off uh, before it reaches your table. Um, he, he said, if we, if we make something and it is legitimately bad, it will make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And there were a few things that I tasted that did that, that were very clearly rotten. Um, now, of course, that's not always true. Like you can't taste be serious spores. You, 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 there's lots of, um, like you're not gonna taste E. coli, um, but generally the guidelines surrounding proper fermentation will exclude them. Um, of course, there's lots of fermenters, even Sandor's like moldy, just scrape it off and keep going, you're fine. Um, and in Noma, we actually never really had a problem with that ever. Um, it, it's funny that, and Suzanne's in the audience, she, she consulted me uh, one particular season where some guests were getting not like violently ill with food poisoning, but like tummy trouble after eating, um, rumbly stomachs, uh, or maybe a bit of loose stool. Um, uh, and, but the way that we were kind of understanding, it wasn't like entire tables, it was never the whole dining room. So it wasn't like an epidemic or a batch of something that had gone bad. We tracked it down to the fact that they were eating like 175 different plants at the height of vegetable season in one sitting. Uh, and these were normally people that were like traveling from the States with, with kind of very restricted diets outside of dining at Noma. So you, you kind of shock their system with FODMAPs. Um, but in and around that time, uh, we, we did a deep dive and did send lots of our ferments off for analysis with uh, Eurofins, a laboratory, and everything came back honky-dory for mycotoxins and, and other, other uh, pathogenic markers. So we kept going, doing what we did. I would say a pretty similar thing, I guess. Yeah, I think that like for the most part, it seems that doing things within established, like traditionally established frameworks seems to generally yield stuff that's okay. I think that um, when it comes to like me and Kim, for example, right now, um, maybe also because we're coming from this more very experimental kind of world where we're willing to sub subject our our bodies to you know risk for the for the in the name of science or or whatever <laughs> you know like, I guess there's of course there's always some kind of little risk but I think co com the combination of like relying on the existing vast you know corpus of traditional knowledge uh, and basic scientific principles of like salt and pH like David was saying. Um, it feels okay. It's accept. It's an acceptable risk for us. Do we subject other people to it or feed it to un unsuspecting people? No. <laughs> um, but what, if we want to do that sort of thing, especially commercializing it as products, then it needs a bit more, yeah, study. But I, I love the idea of using you two as as a bioassay for ferments. So that's <laughs> <laughs> it's still still tanks uh, for stomachs now after all these years. All right, um, next question. Um, let's go to Angie. Do you have a perspective on the relationship between the flavor of fermented foods, health, and an individual's flavor preferences? In other words, might people prefer fermented food flavors that are more beneficial for them? Or is flavor preference more a matter of the flavors to which each person's palate is habituated? Mm, super interesting question. So. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's as, I don't know if it's as simple or straightforward as like the more people, pref the flavors <laughs> that people prefer more are those that are more beneficial. It's probably a bit more complex than that. Um, I think what's one thing that I find particularly interesting in this question is how these matters relate to hand taste. And that's something that I'm I'm planning a bigger project to try to dig into. Um, first, I got to get some funding, small detail, but you know, so there's this idea of hand tastes on map that many 
people probably will be familiar with uh, in the audience, but for those who aren't, it's this basic idea that, uh, well, I guess originally it's not specific to fermentation, it's just this idea from, um, from Korea originally that, you know, if you give, say, the same recipe to 10 different people and the same ingredients, everyone will make a slightly different version simply because of different practices, different habits, different approaches to craft. Of course, when, when you apply that to fermentation specifically, there's this extra dimension that has to do with actually the microbes being different from the actual hand, giving rise to different flavors. But I think what we don't really know very well yet is how that finding feeds back into say, okay, if we even eat foods that have different microbes in them, do they then also come to live on us differently than they would on a different person? And there's some findings that start starting to suggest that. I mean, there's this study came out a few years ago from like Rob Dunn's group um, at North Carolina State showing that uh, the hands of professional bakers, the, micro, the microbes on professional bakers' hands are more similar to the microbes in their starters than they are to the hands of other people, um, which suggests that there's like really, not just metaphorically, but really materially, a very close relationship between a baker who's being exposed to their starter all the time and the starter, such that the question of where the microbes come from, the hands or the starter, kind of becomes hard to answer. Um, so there's that relationship, right, between the, the ferment and the body. Um, we can imagine that there might be similar relationships between, say, the ferment and our oral microbiome or the ferment and our gut microbiome. I guess that's maybe some of the stuff that, that Elisa and Justin are also working on. But what we really don't know, but I think what we could, could be so fascinating to look at is how these different relationships between the fermentation and our body microbiome also come to shape our taste. Because at least I've seen maybe I think two studies so far that very tentatively are speculating that uh, some certain microbes might even be able to shape how we're perceiving certain tastes, like certain microbes in our bodies, right? So when, once we start to put these pieces and these, these, these studies that exist are still very limited, they're very, some of them are a bit more, you know, inconclusive, and they're also scattered in very different disciplines and journals. What happens if we start to bring these dif dif disparate ideas and pieces of knowledge together? Well, a very, you know, tantalizing picture starts to emerge in which there's very loopy feedbacks of relationships between our fermentation practices, the products that we make, the microbes that live in them, the microbes that come to live on us and in us, and in turn affect how we perceive the taste of the products, which in turn changes how we make the product. So anyway, I don't know if it quite answers your question, but, um, but I think only to say your question, I think has even more depth to it. It's a very, it's a very rich question that has a lot of dimensions that we can and should explore further. Hope that didn't veer too much into, yeah, ranting. <laughs> you can tell I'm very keen on it. I muted myself. Hi, uh, I'll just chime in and say, like, even even on like the the grandest level, let's talk about Parmesan cheese. Um, you know, we we worked for generations of we humans, lots of Italians, worked for generations to find just the right microbes that go into Parmesan cheese that also that acidify the curds um, at the front end. But then, as the cheese ages and matures, um, and those cells shrivel up and and die and lice open. Um, they're also just chock full of, of proteolytic enzymes that then go on to make the cheese more rich and full of umami. So that's something that we recognize as more delicious, that we're drawn to, that we've actively made Parmesan cheese to reflect that desire. And you could argue, um, kind of on like the grandest like evolutionary scales, that if you're eating something with more umami, you're getting more accessible nutrition in, in the form of, of already degraded protein. Um, and not having to produce lots of those enzymes or put them to use to yourself. Um, and at least in, in terms of umami and our draw to those tastes and the microbes that help produce them, uh, you can definitely see kind of a broad stroke relationship there. Um, of course, that's not everything to do with, with health on uh, with like a, a fine grain comb, but it, it does kind of relate to, to uh, that vein of thinking. Um, moving on into uh, some questions that were submitted uh, in advance of your lovely talk here, Josh. I'm curious about the possibility um, that the yeast cells from my in-home small-scale kombucha production could interact with those 
in my sourdough starter or vice versa. And that kind of is pursuant to uh, the example that you just gave as well. For sure, because you know both of these are, we could say very specific niches that probably wouldn't exist if it weren't for human humans opening them up as niches, but we also aren't fully kind of in control of them either. Um, and both of them maybe have some, at least some maybe lactic acid bacteria, maybe not the same species, but maybe bacteria that are somewhat related to each other. I guess there's maybe different ways that we could answer the question based on what we mean by interact. Um, and uh, I guess, you know, one thing that I, based also based on say the example I mentioned about the, the bakers in their hands, one, one thing we could imagine maybe is some kind of migration from one to the other. Um, that's, I guess in principle, I could imagine that would be possible, especially because there there's some yeah that are that are similar. Um, I guess the short answer is, it's conceivable. We would have to do some experiments to see. Um, yeah. Right. Um, and now back to the the Q and A, which is picking up. Um, As uh, this is a, a question from Britain, um, Britain Strickland, as you've used sequencing technologies to study your isolates, I'm curious if you've used this technology to study the effects of the host microbiome. Has your work expanded into how fermented food and these novel microbes change the consumer's gut microbiome and what implications this might have for health and disease? I would love to do that. I would love to do that. Um, I haven't done that. I don't have the expertise. I don't have the knowledge. That's what we need groups like Justin's for. Um, so maybe, <laughs> you know, maybe in, in some future project, uh, if, if we can convince some, some funder to give us money to do this, it could be done. I guess, I mean, maybe Justin and or Elisa could speak to this. I could imagine as a non-expert that this kind of question is very interesting and also very complicated to try to answer. Um, I don't know if Justin or Elisa, you have anything to... Let me let me take a crack at it, and then Elisa Please. can clean it up afterwards. Um, <laughs> the uh, you know so in the in the um, it, it's a great question. We have like one example from our lab, a study where we gave people fermented foods um, over a kind of six to ten week period, and then you know very diverse different um, fermented foods, a lot of them up to six servings per day, and then we um, asked the question of how their gut microbiome changed, and and we saw an increase in diversity in their gut microbiome over that time period across the cohort of 18 people that we were surveying. Um, so overall number of species went up, but um, most of those new species were not derived from the fermented foods. So they came from somewhere else, either coming in from the outside and grafting or um, coming up from below the level of detection at baseline to a, a, a higher level that we could detect by the end of the study. So only about I think 5% of the new microbes were um, ones that we had previously detected in fermented foods. So it looks like, you know, the, the microbes from the fermented foods are detectable, but at least in this case, not making up a, a large portion of the microbiome, it's still, we, we don't have a good understanding of engraftment. So if, you know, people had stopped eating fermented foods, what, um, what number of fermented food microbes would have stuck around for a long period of time, kind of beyond just the gut transit and, um, you know, actually shown to, um, to be permanent or more and more stable colonizers. We, we don't have a good handle on that, but um, as you know, you were saying, Josh, I think these niches are so specific and microbes are so the microbes that flourish in a given environment, whether it's kombucha or sourdough or your gut, they're, they're such distinct environments. And there's so much microbial competition anywhere. As soon as you transplant a microbe from one condition into another, it's likely to be outcompeted by other microbes that live there and flourish in that environment. Not always, but but those are you know the odds are against it. So, um, Aliza, I don't know if you have other other things to add to that. I would just say that I mean, even when we're doing mouse experiments, right, and we give them one strain, or even for testing out one um, novel microbe, it's it can be very messy in terms of how we can interpret that and how it changes their microbiome, that um, there is still so much we need to understand about microbial ecology, even in terms of what's happening in the fermented food and then being ingested and then interacting with the gut before we can really say what one 
novel microbe might be doing to a human gut microbiome. Um, even when it comes to like dosage, like what is an appropriate amount because you might be consuming this and, you know, if it's fairly low abundance, it might not make a difference. It might pass through. Um, so it's a, it's a really fantastic question, but I think they're just, I mean, it's very exciting too, that there's just so much left to explore to kind of get at this, but, um, kind of, you know, beginning to characterize these new microbes and understanding, um, you know, why they're in the food, how they got there and how they're able to maintain, uh, their, um, role, um, and their position in the niche is really fascinating. And yeah, I think what Josh is working on is really great to even just start identifying these. Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to pick up on this also brief, brief what you're saying, Lisa, like, um, I feel, and I guess this is not a new, this is echoing what a lot of people already talk about, I think, but it still feels like such early days. I, I feel, you know, it's, we're still in mostly, um, I guess to also respond to, uh, was it Britain? Yeah. Like in some ways we're still very much in kind of like basic natural history mode. We're just like asking who's there, <laughs> you know, who, who's there, what is it? You know, and so before we can answer your really interesting question and more about like causal relationships or like noticing whether something stays when we move, we first have to just understand very basically who's there to start with. And we're still, for so many products, we're still trying to do that. You know, it's like so, um, it's exciting because there's so much to do. Um, but it also means that for those kinds of questions, we have to have a lot of um, manage our impatience. Or I can speak for myself. I have to remind myself that, okay, to get there, there are first certain steps that need to happen first um, and trying to kind of be excited about that too. For example, you know, um, I've been so surprised. We've done some, some of this work on MISO. We have hopefully some papers on it coming out this year. There are, as far as I've been able to find, no papers on MISO ecology, at least in English, using DNA sequencing to study the ecology. It's crazy. I mean, and it's not that it's not that uncommon a product. I mean, it's well, depending on where you are in the world. But um, anyway, only as one example of how much work there is still to do. Um, indeed. Um, I'll, I want to continue this, but we, there's other questions to get through. Uh, one, one from Cameron. Um, thank you very much. Uh, do you find any unique food characteristics in the miso that the novel species was found in compared to others? And more broadly, how do you approach linking food characteristics to the microbial communities that you discover? Great question. Um, and definitely because we're interested in flavor, we that's also one, I guess in my group, the main analytic scientific techniques we use are different DNA sequencing techniques and also um, different metabolomics techniques to study the actual chemistry, the flavor chemistry, and sensory science. And precisely because we're really interested in trying, when possible, to correlate some of the DNA data of who's there with the flavor data of what metabolites are being produced. Um, not There's not always a really nice, neat one-to-one -one correspondence where you can say, oh, okay, this microbe is making this metabolite. But um, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's possible to get a sense of like, okay, the, sometimes it's possible to start to map that out a little bit. Um, of course, it's also very, very complex. Um, I know Elisa has also been doing some work on something similar um, in kefir. So maybe Elisa also has something to add um, about that in a minute. Um, I, I guess, uh, at least speaking of the misos specifically, um, we also of course have tasted all of them. Um, and part of that was at least when I was doing more field work, working with um, with David and Jason and other people at NOMA to actually taste and get some taste, some sensory data from the, well, the experts who taste these all the time. And then also more since then to do some more structured sensory analysis to try to characterize them with, um, you know, with some more uh, like systematic descriptors. Generally, we find that they do have very different flavors. Um, that's, of course, also part of the goal for which they were made. Uh, they have different flavors, not only because of the substrates, but because of the fermentation. But at least the short answer is, at this point, it's not like we're able to say, like, for example, with this exigubacterium, I can't quite yet say, okay, this exigubacterium is producing these flavors specifically. It's possible, but it would take a lot, I think, a lot more work 
for example, isolating specific strains, regrowing them in media, adding them back to the same substrate, you know, one by one, studying them all, like with, you know, doing GCMS or whatever. It's possible, but um, not quite there yet. Yeah, I can just briefly add that. I mean, my approach has been to, I usually do metabolomics. And so I just look at a list of compounds and um, in the hopes in this very naively that I would be able to say, oh, look, there's this compound so there's an increase in banana-like flavor. So got that, check that off. And it does not work that way at all. And um, with, yeah, you, Josh and David that have um, culinary training, really that that's where the expertise uh, kind of comes in, in terms of you, I think at the end of the day, you need to kind of taste and, and see and start to link just because there's so many compounds out there. Some you can measure, you know, you have different instruments to measure different classes of compounds. Um, and then also flavor is complex. It's the taste and the texture and the emotional relationship you have with that food at that time. So, um, there's no, I wish there were just, you know, a little software you plug in the compound and it spits out like, Here's what it's going to taste like, but so far, no one's no one's made that yet. Yeah, no, that's I really like that. That's also really good. I think I I'm I'm often talking about this with my group, and maybe even more stridently with with people who work in food science who don't really think a lot about flavor. Is that the tendency in science, right? Often is to prefer the more objective method. In this case, say metabolomics over sensory. Metabolomics can tell us a lot. That's really useful. But like, as Elise is suggesting, um, it doesn't actually tell us always what things taste like, because there isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence between the flavor compounds and the taste perception. Um, some, for certain molecules, there is a relationship, but I think more often than not, it's much more complex and combinatorial, which is why we also need, well, sensory science and just like tasting and smelling more generally, like the senses being super, I'm gonna put my plug in for the senses here, you know, senses being valuable, that very valuable knowledge. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, and one more question, um, this is one that I submitted in advance, um, that I think kind of maybe sums things up nicely, uh, talking about flavor and microbes um, and speciation. What culturally favored flavors do you see serving as ecological, ecological niches driving speciation today in the microbes used for fermentation? And are there any poignant examples that come to mind? I think a lot about, like I look out my window on the fifth floor and I see rock doves everywhere. And I think pigeons of all things that we used to be here before are very well adapted to cities because cities resemble their old cave-like you know, all the crevasses they used to nest and roost in before we built buildings. Um, so are there any kind of examples of, of that that are driving, where human action is driving microbes into new directions via the foods that we eat or the flavors we love? I mean, I, I don't know if I have a sort of um, total, like a comprehensive perspective on it. It's a super interesting question, at least from from my perspective, working in this kind of like very niche, speaking of niches, right? <laughs> very niche, <laughs> rarefied space of flavor, flavor innovation. Um, like thinking for, okay, I have to think of say the Noma Guide to Fermentation, which of course you wrote. Um, that book, I see that book in so many different places now, um, you know, like, uh, and it's so, it's become so widespread uh, or, you know, indeed, a lot of Sandor's work or any of these, any of these uh, say works that, or forms of knowledge that end up, uh, it's not to say that the more widespread a form of knowledge become, the more useful it is. That's not what I'm trying to say. But if we're thinking about like, to answer your question, what sort of, uh, what sort of uh, things might be driving uh, uh, like certain kinds of say speci speciation or new niches to emerge, uh, today in a very widespread way, something like the Noma Guide or some of Sandra Sandra's books, thinking about how like, okay, they're offering the same techniques, but they're being done in, in different ways all over the world. I, it's so wondrous to me to think about how like people making, starting with the same recipe, but using what they have on hand in lots of different places in the world 
is likely opening up maybe new kinds of niches that just like haven't existed before. Um, starting from like the same kind of original knowledge. I don't but know if that quite just to to add uh, one one specific kind of um, maybe point to the, this question is just the the process of nixtamalization and why that might lead to you know this new bacteria to pop up. Like, is it the uh, you know a, some you know nutrient that's liberated by that process? Is it the higher salt concentration? Is it the pH? Um, and and do you have any any hints there? Um, but maybe that's one example of how like this new niche yeah. is created that is that yeah. allows for this microbe to flourish. Definitely. It's a perfect example. And that was actually what I had, what I was planning to talk about in response, but then I talked about it in my talk and, and anyway. Um, it's it's I think it's a perfect example. I mean, we're looking into it. First, we actually have to isolate it. So that's what we're working on right now, is like trying to isolate this species from the miso. And that, of course, as any microbiologist who's worked in the lab will know is often trickier than it sounds. It can be, it can take a lot of time and energy. So that's what we're currently working on. But I think based on reading about the genus overall, um, my theory is that it's probably been, the niche is, it, well, it's, it's very likely that the niche has been opened up by the higher pH of the nixtamalized substrate in the first place, because a lot of these species like are found, like and are found in high pH environments. Um, like some other species are, are have been isolated from uh, like geysers or uh, other things that, ha yeah, other kinds of environments like that that are high pH in the natural environment. Um, and I think actually a couple other species have been, the couple of species of this genus that have been found in any kind of food associated environment, I think have been, there's one or two that have been found. I think one that's been found in like a, alkaline potato processing plant, very specific. Um, so that also suggests something. And I think the other food associated one has come from like a fish processing plant. So my guess, if I had to guess right now, my guess would be probably the alkalinity. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, I hope I it's new species might... and we can, we can think about what to name it. I don't know what it would be. That'd be, be great. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to talk about that next time. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, we're, we're, it looks like we're all out of time. We want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, we can, of course, always revisit any questions that we miss uh, in the email that we sent out um, after the fact. Uh, I'd like to thank Josh uh, for the wonderful talk and, and, and tour through your explosive mind of ideas and, and experimentation and practice. Um, and of course, uh, the co-organizers and, and Justin Sonnenberg's lab uh without which of course this, this series would not exist um alisa thank you for for all your work and all, doing all the heavy lifting uh in the organizational front and all of the attendees uh who tuned in and if you're watching this after the fact uh, thanks for joining us too on youtube um yeah but thanks for another great installment of the fermentation health speaker series awesome thank you thanks josh thanks david thank you everyone thanks, everybody. thank you bye cheers take care goodbye